This is uh, Jay Harvard, special edition of Amazing Conversations. My longtime friend, Howie Rose. Howie, June 3rd, Hall of Fame, in, in deducted, what does it mean to you? I don't know that I can even put into words exactly what it means to me, Jay, because you know, I grew up in the upper deck at Shea Stadium. And there was no Mets Hall of Fame back then. It wasn't until, I think, 1981 that there even was a Mets Hall of Fame. So that was nothing specific that I aspired to. I certainly aspired to become a broadcaster for the Mets. But thinking back on all the years they've been in business, it's, it's overwhelming. It's hard for me to articulate. I am virtually speechless about how proud and excited I am. To, to be part of that lineage is an honor in itself. And there's, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's a company or just a, a website or a Twitter place called Athlete Logos, and you may have seen it. They put out a beautiful uh, piece of artwork of Lindsey, Bob, and Ralph looking from above at Gary and I standing in front of the Mets Hall of Fame. Right. And it's just I it's saw a beautiful that, thing that I'm sure you'll, you'll work when on. You, when, you, uh, when are you going to start working on your speech? Um, well, as I say, I'm speechless yes. right now, so I'm going to have to discipline myself to find the words. But in, in, in true candor, I've already thought about some of the stuff I want to say. I just need to know the time limit. we, we got to figure out who's going when. I, I read your father was a Yankee fan, God forbid. Yeah. <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was my entry yes. into baseball, 1961. Right. Um, and if you don't know, 1961 was the year that Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle had their epic home run right. duel in chase of Babe Ruth's record of 60, which Maris broke on the last day of the year. So imagine being a seven-year-old kid and being introduced to baseball under those circumstances. It was a thrill a day. And then the next year, there's this new team, and I thought they were created just for me. Did you just pick, pick the Mets? I mean, how did you not stay with the Yankees? Well, it was an easy sort of thing because, you know, first of all, I was never one of those kids that, even as I got a little older, hated the Yankees because I was a Met fan because they didn't play each other. There was no right. interleague play. They weren't really contending for the same thing in the early years of the Mets. But it was as the Mets took hold in New York, which was instantaneous, they were new, and as a baseball fan, I was new, so it was a natural marriage, if you will. And I remember the Mets played their first game on a school night, April 11th, 1962. I couldn't stay up to watch or listen to the whole game, but I distinctly remember waking up early for school the next day and going into my parents' room. My dad was still getting ready for work. I said, how did the Mets do last night? He said they lost, I was disappointed, and so it began. And that would begin. And that was it. Well, I, I know you tell me, what was the first game you saw? At the Polo Grounds? Yeah. Um, the first game I saw at the Polo Grounds, which is interesting because of the date, was July 6th, 1962. Now, that date didn't mean anything to me then, but 24 years later, I would meet my wife Barbara on, that day. on July 6th. But wait, there's more. Now, I'm a huge Beatles fan, as you may know. Right, right. And it wasn't until, I don't know, five or ten years ago that I discovered, because it just jumped out at me when I read it that one particular time, that John Lennon met Paul McCartney on July 6th. Well, that's it. It's a good, 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 it of 1957, I think. My dad used to take me. I, I was a big Willie Mays fan growing know. up. And he took me to the Polo Grounds. I remember I was at the game when Marv Thronberry Miss second base. You were and there? He, I was at that game, and Casey went out and argued, and the umpire said, you, you shut up, he missed third. I forgot. I, I, forgot. <laughs> he missed, I know I'm screwed up. The thing. Casey argued that he missed first, and the umpire yeah. said, stop arguing, he yeah. missed second, too. What was it like the first time you met Tom Seaver? You know, when you were old, Well, you? the first time I ever met him was as part of an interview scrum when I started covering locker rooms in New York. Right. I was with um, Sports Phone in the mid-1970s. Uh, what was a very humbling assignment for me, Jay, was the day after the trade in 1977, I was working for WHN Radio, and our news director, a guy named Charlie Kay, who was also a big Mets fan, assigned me, this is when it was much easier to get through airports, right. pre-9-11, but he assigned me to follow Seaver, he got me the flight number that he was taking to Montreal yeah. to meet his new team, the Cincinnati Reds, meet Tom at the airport, really? follow him on his way to the really? game, and get a couple of sound bites. Really? Tom didn't know me from a hole in the head. 
But there was a part of me, I was 23 years old, I, I was still getting used to this whole idea of being a quote, objective journalist. I wanted to grab Tom by the neck and get him away from that airplane and you know bring him back to Shea Stadium where he belonged. Obviously that didn't happen, but um, that was an interesting kind of experience. Kiki, my first time, when he came back from the Reds in 83, uh, he was in the old Huggins Stangle Fields house. He was in a whirlpool. I put on a new suit. I said, Mr. C, I'm Jay Harris, the PR guy from the Mets. I can't hear you, kid. Come closer. <laughs> Took the hose, <laughs> put it down my pants. I was getting soaked in my. That was my introduction. That was your first time meeting. That was the first time I met Tom Seaver. So this idea of liquid and pants is consistent between been, orange been, juice been, and Frank been, Cashin. It's been, it's been through the years. How many came to the World Series? Did you see a lot of them? Sixty-nine, all of them. It's a long story, but I didn't get to the '69 World Series. Well, why not? Oh, you got a minute? Sure. <laughs> You're not gonna believe this, but. Um, first of all, I didn't have any money growing up anyway, right. so it wasn't like I could just peel some money out of my pocket. Um, but when the Mets clinched first place, I begged my parents to give me a few bucks to not exactly sleep over at Shea Stadium yeah. because my friend's father dropped us off on his way to work and he left real early. We got there about 4.30, 5 o'clock right. in the morning and we had money to go to one game. And we figured the one game that was guaranteed to be played in the league championship series was game three, which would be the first one at Shea. So we got tickets for that. Now, we have to back up a little bit because that summer, my parents, who never went anywhere, they decided they were going to book this weekend at Browns in the Catskills. Oh, really? Which was on the weekend of October 3rd, 4th, and 5th, Friday, Saturday, oh, Sunday. Couldn't get out of it? Well, that Friday... I was a student at Cardoza High School in Bayside, right. Queens, and we were so overcrowded, we were on late session. So we didn't go to school until 12.30 in the afternoon, and we got out a little before 6. But because we were going up to Browns that Friday, ordinarily they'd wait till I got out of school, and my parents said, all right, look, we're going to allow you to miss school that Friday, okay? That was October 3rd. Saturday's the 4th, Sunday's the 5th. They're in Atlanta, they win both games. Now, I know I told my parents, that I was gonna miss school on the 6th and go to the Met game, but that meant missing school on Friday and the following oh, Monday. Oh, no good? Little suspicious, especially yeah. because we were on late session, not going to school until right. 12.30. Well, long story short, I go to the game that Monday, the Mets win the pennant. Joe Torrey makes the last half. Well, that was the division, division clincher, right. Right, right, right? The pennant clincher was Monday afternoon, the 6th, and I come home from school and I've got half of, you know, statute of limitations, okay? Statute of limitations. I'm wearing half of center field around my neck when I walk in. I walk in, I yell, we won the pennant. Okay. My father looks at me, where were you? Oh boy. <laughs> I said, where were we? Look, Tommy Agee stepped here, Cleon <laughs> Jones. I became the first kid since Spanky and Alfalfa to have gotten a visit from the truant officer. Really? Because I was out Friday and Monday, Truett officer literally came to my parents' house. Yeah. I wasn't there. Oh boy. I don't know how they missed it, but they somehow didn't tell the Truett officer I was at Shea but Stadium. you watch it on TV though, I mean. With the World Series? Yeah. Well, A, they wouldn't give me money to, to go to a World Series right. game. And B, I, you know, we missed, I, I was able to watch one of the three games at Shea because it was the Vietnam War moratorium. Right. So no school that day. So I missed games three and five and listened in school. Hi, let me ask you this. I'm a more about history. How do you remember the details? Who was on second base? Who was on third base? You know, listening on the radio. I mean, is it photographic memory? I mean, you mean I, from games in the no, past? Any, or? anything in the past. I mean, I mean, well, I marvel at how you remember the minute stuff. And I remember the basics, but I don't have the detail. I mean, is it I just, think. It's certainly not a photographic memory because yeah. I, I don't have any short-term memory. I forgot what we started talking about yeah, in this too. interview. But what's but your that, name, Bob? Yes, exactly. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> uh, that that comes with advancing age anyway, I hope. But um, a lot of it stems from two things. A, those moments meant a lot to me. You know, but the so details, the big moments. Little things? I hear you, but the, the, you know, the, the, when I hear you God, describe Who's he on deck? So, you know what I mean? I'm not saying that. Some of it's organic, yeah. and, and some of it, you know, we have the benefit of being able to either look things up on RetroSheet yeah. to confirm our suspicions or not embellish them, but sort of illuminate them. 
in detail. So can I make you feel old for a second? Uh, yeah, nobody has to. You're, I'm feeling you're, you're it now. You're working with Tom McCarthy's son. This oh my year. God. A former partner's son. Yeah. Uh, Pat, right? Yeah. Is that? Is that <laughs> <laughs> well, Pat, between Pat and Keith Ratt is, is 29, so used to be we'd go out for a, a, a beer or something now after a game. Cream and a yeah, now cream. I got to take these kids yeah. out for ice cream after a game. But again, you know, you, Wayne is a great guy, which of all the best. Yeah. How much longer does it take to you to get to the ebb and flow with Keith if he's going to be the main guy? It, it, you have to allow for it to grow naturally. Right. And I don't, I don't put a time frame on it. The first couple of games we did, as virtual strangers yeah. at the end of February this this spring, I thought went exceedingly well yeah, in that regard too. in particular. Um, and you know, Keith was a kid that while we were doing our uh, interviews, right. interviewing the finalists on Zoom, I had budgeted in, in my mind like 20 minutes, half yeah. hour. Uh, Keith and I went about 40, 45 minutes, and I could have gone longer. So that was the first indication that we were going to get on with. I remember in the paper he read it, he, had, he was reading up on Seinfeld episodes. Yeah, yeah. He, <laughs> he dropped the Seinfeld that's, line That's in. great. You know, that I mean, you know, I mean, because you would wait, played off each other. He would, you yeah. know, play dumb. I didn't know about this. It was 98 years ago. Right, but, we had fun with that. Yeah, I mean. It, I, it, you know what it is, Jay? It, it's what goes around comes yeah. around. And when I started broadcasting Ranger games, in the mid 1980s, my broadcast yeah. partner was Sal Red Light Messina, yeah, yeah. and I used to give him the business about him being the old guy. Yeah. He's about 14, 15 years older than me. Well, now I've gotten it back in spades between Billy Jaffe and Wayne Randazzo, and between Keith and Pat. Yeah. Oh, I mean, they could just level me when it comes That's to. Right. I want two calls. I want to go with them before the famous Mike Piazza home run call. You were on uh, TV then, right? Yes. You, Yes. And I remember you told me beforehand, and your quote was, I think it's got a chance. <laughs> and you told me you were kind of made, they wanted you to go that yeah. way. And well, to, <clears throat> tell the story better yes, than there, I Yes, there is a backstory. Um, that night, September 21st, 2001, was only 10 days after the attacks. And we, meaning the collective New York, were a fragile bunch and a nervous bunch. And so when I got to the ballpark, the executives at Madison Square Garden Network came upstairs to the booth and they talked to Fran, Ralph, and me, and they said, look, this is gonna be a, a, a game unlike any other that you've ever right. done. We don't know how uneasy the crowd's gonna feel, but there are a lot of very sensitive and very, very touchy subjects. So, you know, we don't want you to emote like you usually would. And whatever you do, you know, it's, it's a solemn night. So don't use words that can really set people off, like bombs, explosions, the kinds of words that come up in the lexicon right. of baseball. Stay away from that stuff. So I'm thinking, geez, this is going to be different because I don't know how the game's going to evolve. Right. I don't know how the crowd's going to be. I don't know how excited I'm going to get. But they wanted us to temper our enthusiasm. And Curb so, your enthusiasm, if you will. The good TV show. Yeah. Make a TV show. So when so, Mike hits the ball, you. So Mike hits the ball, and it's on its way to Great Neck. Yeah. You know, there's no question yeah, about it. Okay. But I can't go. This ball's long gone or anything like that. It's so, a real bob shot. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So I say, trying to, you know, kind of ease into it. I go. This one has a chance. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Yeah, it had yeah. a chance to get to the Whitestone right. Bridge before it came down, but. Um, that was the story behind that. But the funny part about it is, and you remember, um, Fran Healy, who was on the air with me that night, did, did not have a great relationship with the MSG people. Right. So he couldn't wait to tweak them. So after the home run, after Mike gets back to the dugout, we've been quiet for a while. Finally, Healy says, this place just exploded. <laughs> he goes, oh, they were waiting to explode, <laughs> and they just, I mean, he just wanted to Did you get, did you get any emails? Well, there? I didn't. I was a good boy. I don't know about it. The other one I got to talk about is, is Mateau, right? I yeah. mean, in the, with game seven, play with Devils, double overtime, yeah. your cause being come, really, your signature almost. In, do you, you still have a good relationship with Mateau? With, with oh, coach? yeah, we're friends. I mean, I, I speak to him from time to time. I've played golf with him. Um, we're did, hoping to do some sort of um, show together as we approach the 30th anniversary. Did you ever think you would come to that, uh, when you said it, you no. know, I mean. 
No, I thought... And the Rangers won. They haven't won since. Right? Well, that's the, that you touch on an important point. I don't know that that call would endure as it has unless they finished the job and won the cup. It reminds me that's of, big remember Chavez's catch in the yeah. playoffs? And we had yeah. one, you know, a right. different. Right. So, uh, this winter, January, uh, it's the baseball writer. Yep. How did you come to disclose your... Your, your cancer you really had kept it under wraps yeah. a little bit. Uh, I, I worked pretty hard, Jay, not to be specific about right. it while I was going through it because the doctors had been as reassuring as possible right. that this would turn out fine. Um, so just go through the surgery, go through the recovery, get back to as close to normal as possible, and, and that'd be that. But when the baseball writers gave Mike Vaccaro, who went through something pretty right, serious right. too, and, and me, the, uh, the Richmond Award, named after Arthur and Milton, uh, you gotta have heart award, I just felt when I was gonna give my acceptance speech that they're gonna be nice enough to honor me, and right. there are 800 people there right. or whatever. I've gotta talk about why, and I thought it would be a bit of a catharsis, and it was, and then Andrew Marchand from agree, the Andrew Post. Andrew a great piece. I book. knew he would. Great piece. You know, he called me a couple of days after the event. Yeah, it was because, very, very touchy and very... Yeah, I think the, the video of my speech was out there, yeah. and so Andrew saw it. And you doing Chelsea was there, right? Uh, Chelsea was there, yeah. yeah. And, and Andrew um, asked me if, if Barbara and I would be willing to talk on the record yeah. about it, and I said, you know, now that it's out there, I would, let me ask Barbara, she said she would, and I knew I could trust Andrew to hit all the right notes, and he did. Was your time during the whole period, do you thought, is it, is it, am I getting it back to normal? Did you have doubt through the whole process? Well, you, all, you always have doubt. Yeah. Um, very quickly after the surgery, it, it didn't take long for the pathology to come back. You know, they looked at the areas all around there, everything was clean. So the, the surgeon said, you're good to go. Yeah. You know, this is, you just have to recover from the surgery now and, and move on. And, so, um, so I was always confident to get back on the air. So you've been doing TV or race since 95, right? I well, mean, it's complicated. You know, I started doing the Mets Extra pre and post game show in 87. 87 did yeah. that for five years. Then previous management and I had our differences. No, really? What happened? Yeah, uh, <laughs> it was a long time ago. And Were you with the no-fly zone for a while? <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I was one of the first wind, yeah, ones in. No-fly zone. Woo! No. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but very quickly after that happened, um, I don't want to be vague about it. Let's just say Frank Cashin and Al Harrison and I had our differences right. about how that show should be presented. And so they were able to kind of marginalize yeah. it a little bit. I still was at the ballpark. I was still doing pre and post game stuff. But, you know, Fred Wilpon came to me in the summer of 93 and said, I want to apologize for letting it get to this point. You yeah. belong with us. And, it's been clear sailing ever since. The excitement is still there for you in the new oh, season. Yeah. Expectations oh, are yeah. the team. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, look, Steve Cohen has injected so much new energy as ownership changes often do. It happened in 1980 when the ownership changed. Right. It's happened again. And, you know, all those years, Jay, when, and remember the timing involved, when free agency started, uh, the Mets chose not to be players, right? And that resulted in the downfall of the franchise right. for a number of years. And at the same time, George Steinbrenner took the exact opposite approach: right. was signing Reggie Jackson and all the big stars, Catfish Hunter, even before free agency was legislated into the game. And you remember, Mets fans then would say, "Boy, I wish George Steinbrenner owned the Mets." Now he is. Now they yeah. have their yeah. George Steinbrenner yeah. without that bombast. Yeah. Hey, I, I want to thank you for all the support you've done for our alumni stuff. Oh, you, Jay. When I switched jobs, you said, Jay, this will work, this will work, this will work. It has worked with your support and ownership. Just want to thank you for your friendship, my friend. Jay, thank you for let me time. tell you something, and people should know. Um, there have been very few people who have been as influential in shaping the organization and the image of the organization as, as well as Jay has. And putting him in charge of the alumni was an absolute perfect yeah. marriage and it culminated an old timers yeah, day last great. year which was and we were last day. thing you and i were supporters of willie's retirement yes couldn't come out better you know we did the right thing because we could keep a secret we we we, <laughs> we did we, we did the right thing to do the right thing yes and and uh 
Unfortunately, Willie's not able to travel anymore. I wanted to get him to come out this year, but it was a great thing we did. I'm really. And you know what? I don't know if you're pressed for time. I just want to relate real quickly how I could see as I made the announcement, and it was pretty dramatic because yeah, nobody it knew it was coming. My podium was set up right near home yeah. plate, and there's not much room between home plate and the backstop. I could see the reaction of people yeah. when I made the announcement. I could see some people wiping their yeah. eyes. It was that emotional. It was the right thing for the right reason. The right thing, and really, really appreciate it. You really I'm, did. So, but I'm again, happy about that. thanks for being a friend, Jay. Thank you. Uncle Jay, we got a lot of uncles here. We got Uncle Jay. <laughs> well, we got Uncle Steve. Oh. One big happy family. Thank you, Howie. Appreciate you taking the time to come up. My pleasure, man.